Welcome, good morning everyone to Monday Mornings at Maine Online Edition. My name is Heather Miller and I am an adult programming librarian here at the La Crosse Public Library. And we're so glad you could join us today for our very special presentation. Uh, our presenter today is Jeff Rand. He is one of our very own reference librarians. He's worked here for the last 36 years and we're so pleased to hear him speak today on the Heroes Next Door project. So thanks for joining us, Jeff. Good morning, thank you everybody for tuning in. Um, this is my first Zoom presentation, so hopefully I will push all the right buttons. We're talking about Heroes Next Door helping save the world in 1945. This is a project that is designed to illuminate and preserve the history of La Crosse County's participation in the last year of World War II. And first of all, I need to uh, give some credit to other people. I'm certainly not the only one who's been working on this. Scott Brower has been a key person in this whole project. Uh, he handles the back end of storing scanned articles on the archive website so that they will be available, I'll say, forever. Uh, and also Deb Hestigan, who worked in uh, our department. She did a lot of data input the first half of the year until June 10th when we had our budget induced reduction in force. She was unfortunately laid off. Uh, Scott, and Anita, the archivist, and I had a discussion the day after, can we keep going with this? And Scott uh, and I both thought we could, and he offered to do all the work that Deb had been doing before. So he picked up all of that extra work. So Scott's been very important in, in this project. Alan Mask helped me with setting up the web page. I had worked with web pages on our previous websites, but not this uh, current one. So he helped me set that up. Heather Miller has helped me out throughout Whenever I have technical problems with the web page, uh, most of the problems are usually on the operator end, and she straightens me out there. Anita Doring, our archivist, uh, approved the project, and also Barry McKnight, who is our adult programming lead, uh, approved the project, and they've been helped to promote it and support it. I'm going to take about 30 minutes going through the basics of the project uh, this morning, and then I'm going to go to the website live to show you how to get to it and how to navigate around it, and then we'll take questions at the end. So uh, the four parts of my presentation this morning, first of all, I'm going to let you know why we're doing this, what the procedure is, how we're doing it, what good is it for everybody, and then the fourth part, actually going to it, and how do you get to it and navigate around. So first of all, why we're doing it. There were three uh, causes for the creation of this project. The first occurred in August of 2019. A person contacted the library. She wanted information about the liberation of Epinal, France in September 1944. Of course, Epinal is a sister city to La Crosse. And she wanted information on that so she could write an article for the newspaper in September 2019 on the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Epinal. And the question came to me, and that was rather appropriate because I've had an interest in military history and especially World War II history since I was young. I spent a couple days on it, working on it. I found that our book collection did not offer much information. It was relatively minor in the bigger scheme of the European theater of operations. Uh, there was some good information online, which I uh, gathered, but the best source that I found was in our federal document collection. It was in a set of books which are commonly referred to as the Green Books, which is the official United States Army history of World War II. There, was, there were several pages, almost a chapter on the liberation of Epinal by the 45th Infantry Division. And it gave detail down to the battalion level. So I put that information together, sent that off to her and she wrote her article. Uh, and that was a, a very fun research question for me. The second, event that led up to this project occurred in November 2019. Molly here in the middle, she is my cousin's daughter. She contacted me and said that her husband's father wanted background information on her family. Now, Sam is British and her, his father, of course, is in England. So we were corresponding by email. In preparing that information, I reviewed things and updated things for him before I sent it off. And I was reminded of the story of Molly's grandfather, my uncle, Sergeant Tom Howard. He was an infantryman in World War II in France in 1944 and 1945. 
Early January 1945, his division was defending a town in France called Hatton. The Germans had launched an offensive with the objective of recapturing the city of Strasbourg in France. So uh, there was a fierce battle around the village of Hatton uh, for several days. The Americans eventually had to withdraw. They were, um, could not hold the town. My uncle's company, and we're talking company about 150 to 200 men were surrounded in the town. He was one of the few survivors of that group. And he was captured by the Germans. He spent the rest of the war in a POW camp. Uh, so that was January through May until his camp was liberated by the Russians. It was an experience that he never really talked about much. He wouldn't even talk about it uh, with his children. Uh, they told me when the more they asked him, the more he would just climb up. So the parts of his story that I have are just scraps that I picked up from other people who heard things through the years. Uh, when they were initially captured, one of the first things the Germans did was, of course, was disarm them and search them. And they were executing any American soldier who had anything on them that they thought had been taken from a German soldier, either from a POW or a, a, the body of a German soldier. My uncle had some German coins in his pocket. So he knew this was bad news. He was not going to live through this if they found those coins. With his hand, he managed to punch a hole in the bottom of his pocket to let, and let those coins slip out underneath his pant leg. And then I suppose he probably ground them into the dirt or whatever before they were marched off to the railhead uh, to be transported to the POW camp. So he um, avoided death that way. They had no food and water. They were packed into railroad cars. I am told that they licked rainwater off the sides of the railroad cars on the way to their prisoner of war camp. Once they were in the camp, hunger was the biggest en enemy besides the Germans. Uh, my cousin, his son, has a rudimentary diary that Tom Howard kept while he was in the POW camp, but it was written in pencil. So nearly everything has faded away through the years. My cousin told me the only thing he can still read is, quote, no food for four days, end quote. They were so hungry, let me tell you a little, a little story I picked up from someone else. Um, they got some seeds in a Red Cross packet, and so they planted a garden in the prisoner of war camp. But at night, some of the guys snuck out of the barracks, and this was a, a offense for which they could be shot. They dug up the seeds and ate them. They were so starving. So as I mentioned before, this is an experience that he never talked about much. I certainly never asked him about it. And he took most of the story with him to the grave, which is very unfortunate. The third and really crucial thing that led to this project was a letter from the National World War II Museum in November 2019. It was a fundraising letter. It was actually addressed to people who had lived at our house previous to us. She had apparently uh, donated to them in the past. I've been to the National World War II Museum in New Orleans. It's an outstanding museum. And they were asking for a donation, of course. And it pointed out in the letter that 2020 would be the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II. So I looked at that and I thought, well, I should do some book displays next year for that. So this letter sat on the, my desk at home for several days. December 5th, very early in the morning, I woke up. Could not get back to sleep. I started thinking. That's always a bad sign when you're trying to get back to sleep. And this idea came to me. What if we went through the newspapers starting in January 1945, day by day, week by week, and see how the war unfolded from the perspective of somebody who was living in La Crosse at that time? So I got up at 4.20 a.m. in the morning, went into my office, pulled out that letter, and started scribbling notes, as you can see, on the front and back of that letter of ideas of how this could happen. So that was the real genesis of the, of the idea for this project. How, do we, how are we going about doing this? So here's how it developed over time. December 10th, I made my pitch to first Anita uh, Doring, our archivist, and Barry McKnight, our adult programming person. We both thought it was a great idea. In fact, Anita said right away, let's go talk to Scott and see how we can do this. So we had our initial discussion on December 10th. Uh, Scott had an idea right away how he could handle these scanned articles. And uh, we had it um, 
had a good start right away there. The next day, I started scanning articles from the La Crosse Tribune, the first week of January 1945. After doing one week, I knew that I needed to make an adjustment of what I was trying to do. My original idea was to cover a nine county area around La Crosse. And after doing that for a week, I realized it was just impossible to handle that kind of volume, the depth and breadth of participation from this area during World War II, and that would be the same for any, anywhere in the country, was just overwhelming. So I decided we're gonna to have to focus this down to just La Crosse County. We'll use the La Crosse Tribune, just get the La Crosse County articles. We'll use the three newspapers, the county newspapers in the county, the Bangor was Salem and on Alaska, and that'll be the basis for our project. Now that meant excluding Camp McCoy, which is in Monroe County, of course, since we're focused on Cross County, I didn't want to include all that. You could do a whole book on Camp McCoy on World War II. I'll just uh, give you a few insights on that. Camp McCoy was a major training base during World War II. Many units trained there, including the 2nd Infantry Division. Uh, another unit that trained there was the 100th Battalion, which was all Japanese Americans from Hawaii. They were attached to the 442nd Regimental Combat Team, which fought with great distinction in France and Italy. There was also a German POW camp at Camp McCoy. There was a Japanese POW camp at Camp McCoy. Uh, just a sidelight, my grandmother worked in the laundry during World War II at Camp McCoy. And she told me at one time she remembered seeing the prisoners out there exercising in the prison yard when she was working there. And another thing about Camp McCoy is that of course with La Crosse being the closest big city, men when they had leave or furlough, they would come into La Crosse for recreation. At the end of the war, Camp McCoy was one of the re, uh, redeployment centers. So there were thousands and thousands of servicemen and women coming from Camp McCoy for, uh, from Europe and from the Pacific for reassignment to other bases or to get their discharge. And that's uh, in the scanning that I'm doing now in uh, October, November of 1945, that's coming up almost every day. On December 16th, I made the mock-up of the webpage that I wanted to have. I knew I wanted to have three portions, one that covered the servicemen and women from La Crosse County. Also wanted to cover the home front in La Crosse County. And also then the bigger picture of the national international context for this. On December 21st, that was a Saturday. Alan Mask and I were working at the reference desk together. And in between helping people, we were working on creating the web pages that you're going to see at the, at the end of the presentation. Uh, as I said, I had never worked with this current website, so he helped me through the process to get that set up. At the same time, Scott was working in archives, and he was setting up the back end of, for this project, the place where the articles are going to be stored. So by the end of that day, on Saturday, December 21st, we had the basic web pages developed, and we had a connection between them, so you could go from the front page to the, to the back end of it. I think Scott and I shook hands just like the Americans and Russians did at the Elbe River in World War II. And then on May 7th of December, I started working on the first feature articles, which I'll talk about more later on. Uh, the web pages were ready enough so that we could publish them on January 2nd. We didn't make them live on the website until after the first week in January because we wanted to get that first amount of material in there. It all starts with the uh, newspaper files a microfilm that we have in the archives room. So you look at a box of microfilm for La Crosse Tribune, a daily newspaper, two, uh, one or two months on a reel. When I look at this, I see stories that are waiting to be rediscovered. It's like a treasure chest. I'm a, I'm a real nurse, newspaper nerd. And the way to get them out is to put them on a microfilm reader scanner. Uh, this microfilm reader scanner the only thing I've spent more time with this past year has been my wife. It can, uh, it will magnify the images on the microfilm. You can make paper copies or scan digital copies from it. Here are just some examples of pages. Here's a La Crosse Tribune page. And on this particular page, this is, I think it's from a Sunday newspaper late in the year, there are five different articles about servicemen from La Crosse County. So I have scanned all these. Sometimes there would be six or seven articles on a single page. Sunday was a big day, especially in La Crosse Tribune. I think that's the day when they printed all the uh, all of the uh, 
press releases from the armed forces. And then anybody who had been discharged or was on home for furlough stopped by the Tribune office, you got the taken in there before he appeared in the newspaper. A cross county record was published weekly in Alaska. It came out on Thursday. And you can see here they have a column, Boys at War. That was always on the front page of the newspaper, plus they had other articles throughout the newspaper on Alaska Holman uh, men and women in the service. The West Salem Journal started the year of 1945 as the Non Journal. And then in the end of August of 1945, it changed its name to the West Salem Journal. Uh, a veteran actually returned from service, was discharged, and bought the newspaper and changed the name to West Salem Journal. And you can see here on the front page, they have with those who were service. So there was a column there, plus they had articles throughout the newspaper on, on service men. The Bangor Independent, and they have a <clears throat> with boys in the service, column two on the front page, and articles throughout the newspaper. These, all three of the county newspapers, Bangor, Wasilm, and Alaska newspapers came out on Thursday every week. There's some overlap between them, but there's enough unique content that makes it worthwhile to go through them. Jeff, if I could just I back on there for a moment. We're having some issues with your audio. Um, people are saying it's a bit choppy and it's hard to hear. Would you mind leaning in a little bit closer to your microphone and see if that improves things? Will do. Thank you. So in selecting articles for uh, scanning, I kept track one week. It took about four hours to get to the La Crosse Tribune, seven issues. Sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less. And the Cross County Record, which is the Alaska newspaper, if I would do all four issues for that month, about an hour and a half. Uh, quirk about the Cross County Record. The pages jump from page one to page four to page five to page eight. Uh, Scott theorizes that pages two and three and page six and seven were just advertising that the historical society did not microfilm. That's, that's what we're thinking happened there. I did not catch on to that right away, so you may see some articles earlier in the year that say page two of the La Crosse County record. It's actually page four. Uh, that was a mistake early on. The West Salem non Journal, later West Salem Journal, if I were going to do four issues of that at one time, about an hour and three quarters for that. And that one has no page numbers. Usually it'd be 18 pages long. Bangor Independent. That one uh, has three or four pages, takes about an hour to do uh, four issues. Lately, I've been, uh, for most of the year now, uh, the second half of the year, I've been doing the same issue with the Lacrosse Tribune for that week instead of doing all four at once. Uh, and you might wonder about the time it takes to go through a newspaper so short. The county newspapers also had columns for the little community, Sour Creek. Burns, Black Oak, little community areas. And they had these little sentences and paragraphs. So and so visited so and so. So and so had dinner with so and so. And whenever a soldier was on leave, it would say something about that. So I'm including all those little snippets in there. And you can see those in the page articles. And that one, as I mentioned, they had no page numbers, but it's only about three or four pages. Uh, the this is the 1940s, of course, so there's some sexism at, at work here. Even in the column, Our Boys at War, the first article is about a woman in the service. And that happened consistently throughout. The La Crosse Tribune had a page, usually page four in the newspaper, news for and about women, thinking that only women would be interested in that page. That was really a, uh, a rich source for me too, because it did cover, for example, marriages and engagements, and I did include those in the project. And here's how I did that. If a La Crosse County serviceman married someone, I put that article in the service. If a La Crosse County woman married a serviceman from outside of La Crosse County, that went into on the home front, that would be towards them married. And there were a lot of what I'll call extra geographical marriages because Men were stationed all over the country, all over the world. And it, it, inevitably, there were some relationships that developed from that. So somebody living in Texas now might be surprised that their family roots are in Wisconsin. And that's because somebody, great grandpa, was stationed at Camp McCoy, 
met a woman in, in the lacrosse area and they got married later on or vice versa, it works both ways. And also with names, it's, names were most often written Mr. and Mrs. the husband's name or Mrs. the husband's name. You didn't know that women even had first names at that time. So you have to realize that that's what was going on in the 1940s. Early on, the project had display in the library with a bulletin board. I would uh, print a few selected articles from each week, put those on the bulletin board as a promotion to the website and with some books to display. Uh, that all disappeared when COVID hit. In fact, on March 18th, when we found out that we were closing at five o'clock that day, we didn't know how long we were going to be closed. I was actually in the archives room scanning microfilm for this project. Anita said to me, why don't you take one of the machines home so you can keep do working on this? And that's what we did. We boxed up one of the machines, I hauled it home, set it up in my basement. So here's my basement set up, which I used for two and a half months. And I, so I was scanning microfilm and we were able to put those uh, on a part of our intranet so Scott could access those and process them for the back end of the archives website. And I was working on feature articles from home then too in my office. So for two and a half months, this is how we kept the project going. Now the pieces of it, big picture, I wanted to have the international and national context of what this was fitting into. The big picture was actually the name of a US Army television program that I remember from my youth. So I sort of borrowed that title. This is on two front pages. Originally what I did was scan just the top part, the front page of Lacrosse Tribune, and then added some text below to explain some of the headlines and a little context. After a few months of doing that, I abandoned that in favor of just scanning the whole front page and letting people read the whole front thing for themselves. Uh, the workload was a little bit too much to do the scanning, the feature articles, and this too. So I went to that. In the service, of course, covers servicemen from La Crosse County. This photograph is taken in Texas. This was an Army Air Force base. The B-17 bomber in the background. And here are just a couple of random examples of articles that would go in the service. Any, any man or woman who was in the service from La Crosse County, that's where those would go. On the home front, covers La Crosse County. What was going on in the home front? There was rationing, there were clothing drives, rag drives, recycling of tin cans, uh, war bond drives, all that going on in support of the war effort. That's the type of thing that's covered there. And here are just a couple of examples. Advertisement from Cargill's, uh, talking about saving coal. Uh, there were blackouts too, that was to save electricity, thereby saving coal, which could be used for war material and in the war effort. And this, uh, a letter from home appeared in La Crosse Tribune every Sunday, except for one when they had a personnel change. And it summarized the news from La Crosse County that week. Now I'm sure that this was clipped out of a lot of newspapers and mailed to servicemen and women all over the world. It caught them up on the local news. This might be the first time that they would hear what happened to some of their people they went to school with or some of their friends and family, whatever. Feature stories I've mentioned. I'm writing two of those per week for the front end of the website, one for the in the service portion and one for on the home front. What I'm doing, I go through the articles for that particular week in 1945, and I pick out one to feature, to uh, do a, a full story on. And what I'm looking for is, can I add value to that story beyond what's in the newspaper article itself, the research, and uh, providing some context? Uh, so, for example, uh, a person is a crewman on an airplane. Well, well, I'll talk about the airplane itself uh, and then what kind of mission it had and then how it fit into the larger war effort. Also, can I inform people about something about World War II and doing, and doing that? Uh, the article on recycling tin cans, well, what did tin cans contribute to the war effort? One of the things was the cans for the uh, K rations and C rations, and also for the uh, morphine styrets that were used by medics. And can I educate people on, on different aspects of World War II? I'm also looking for variety, looking for people in different branches of services, uh, both men and women in different geographic areas with different jobs, um, trying, to, trying to bring all of that in there with the feature articles. One of my favorite feature articles for in the service is this one, which I entitled Purple Hearts. Uh, Mr. Meyer, Rudy Meyer, 
was my guidance counselor in high school. He also taught a, a physics class as a senior. And one day in that class, I don't know how we got off on the topic, but he spent about five minutes talking about his World War II service, how he'd been an infantryman. He'd carried a bazooka, which is a rocket launcher to be used against tanks. Uh, he was in Third Army, General Patton's Third Army, mentioned that he'd been wounded, he'd lost a lung, and that was about it. I didn't know anything more about the story until I started doing this project. I read this article written by these, especially in the West Salem newspaper, about him. Here's one from March of 1945. He was wounded December 10th, 1944. He's still in the hospital in March, and he still cannot walk. He had a very long recovery from his wound, multiple wounds. Even when he started uh, teaching again, in 1946, he could only work a half a day. He didn't have stamina. He had to work up to give it things up. Uh, he went on, he taught at Melrose Medoro schools for many, many years, very respectful educator. When he retired, he moved back to the town of Salem, very involved in the community. Um, when I wrote this article, I reached out to some people who knew him and got some really good information about what a, what a fine, wonderful man he was. So I have a special connection to this particular article. So it's one of my favorites of in the service. On the home front, I think my definite favorite is Mother Peck and her boys. This is Anna Peck with her daughter, Marion. They lived in La Crosse. They also had a, a Marion had a younger sister named Edith. The men at Camp McCoy, when they came to La Crosse for the weekend, could come to La Crosse only if they had a place to stay for the weekend. So, uh, Anna Peck and her husband opened up their home to soldiers on the weekends. They stayed there for the weekend. She did their laundry. She did sewing for them. They made a, made a big Sunday meal for them. But she had one rule. Saturday night, they had to be back in her house by 10 p.m. And I was able to contact Marion's son and uh, daughter-in-law. And they told me a lot of this story. And the, the son brought in this guest book that Anna Peck had kept at her home where the servicemen signed. And when I held that, that book, the hair stood up on the back of my neck because you know that some of the people who signed this book never came back. They were in infantry divisions, they went to Europe, they went to the Pacific, and some were killed in the war. One of the amazing things about this story is that after they shipped out, they kept writing letters Anna Peck. And even later in life, for the rest of their lives, they wrote, they corresponded with Anna Peck. Her son said that, that his mother, Marion, had bundles and stacks of letters from servicemen who had stayed at their home when uh, Marion was a child. Uh, Marion and her sister slept under the kitchen table because they had servicemen in all the beds, the chairs, on the floor, all over the house. Uh, this, was, this was quite a story. A lot of the feature articles involve writing about people. And as I mentioned, I've been family history since the 1970s, so it's very similar to doing that. I'm usually starting with one piece, occasionally two or three pieces to a jigsaw puzzle. There's no box with a picture on the outside that shows what it's supposed to look like in the end. You have to go out and find the pieces, and you never find all the pieces. Uh, but hopefully you get enough to put together so you can see what it looked like in total, even if you don't know all the details. So what good is, is all of this that we've been doing? First of all, we're preserving history. I think that's a good thing whenever we can. We've lost so much history, whether it's our national history, our state history, our local history, our family history. I, I think it's a, a great thing to preserve history. Even if we don't have a use for it immediately, someone in the future very likely will. I love this photograph. This is a young man who made it his mission to interview as many World War II veterans as he could while they were still alive. And his picture is on our website shortly and the link to the story. And also, uh, also uh, we're running out of time to express our appreciation to these people, both in the service and on the home front who made sacrifices, uh, put themselves in danger in many instances to preserve freedom for the whole world. Uh, this was an article about James Rice of lacrosse. He was on an aircraft carrier in the South Pacific. I wrote a feature article about him and his service on an aircraft carrier and how aircraft carriers, of course, were the, the key component of winning the war in the Pacific. It's in a paper copy of the article. Him. He lives in an assistant living uh, 
facility here in La Crosse. And he sent a very nice thank you note. So I was able to e express my appreciation to at least one who are working through that. It's been very hard to not connect with people because of COVID and of course, many people have passed away. And I also like to make uh, connections to local history here. This photograph is the Anna Peck home where the soldiers uh, from McCoy stayed on weekends when they were on leave in La Crosse. And I love this photograph because of the light in the window. To me, it signifies the warmth and welcome, welcome feeling that they must have felt when they stayed at that home. This is the exact same house it was in 1945. It's not far from the library. One day after work, I drove over there to uh, get a photograph of it. The sun had just gone down. Uh, there was light snow falling. I stepped in the street and took a, took a couple of photographs. Then later on, I thought I better get permission to use this photograph from the owners before I put it in a, on our website on a feature article. I didn't have a phone number. I did have a name of a person who lived there and the address. So I sent them a letter, asked them what I was doing, asked for permission to use this, this photograph. I didn't get an answer back. So I was prepared to do the article without the photograph. Fortunately, I had to postpone that article for a few weeks because of making an appointment with uh, Anna Peck's grandson when he was going to bring in that guest book. So I had to postpone the article for a while. I got an email back from the person who lives in the house and said, my husband had a heart attack when we got your letter or at the time of the, that she got my letter. So they answered, they've been sort of busy. Fortunately, he recovered and everything was good. She said, yes, please do use the photograph. So I was able to put it in the article that I published that week. Uh, got a nice uh, uh, email back from her. Glad to use the photograph and glad to learn the history of her house. I think it's uh, worth, worth it for the remembrance of the, of again, the sacrifice uh, that people made during that time so that we can be the country that we are now. And I, the world was under an existential threat from from Germany and Japan at that time. Uh, who knows what would have happened had they prevailed. There are lessons to be learned from this. I'm just gonna pause here and let you read this. I cut it down as much as I could without uh, taking away any of the meaning of it. And uh, Ed is in our audience today. I think he's back in Wisconsin for deer hunting from his home in Spain where he retired. Thank you, Ed, for allowing me to use this in the presentation. And as he says, so many stories we never hear because they went to the graves with the people and Here's the second part. We could use a little bit of that now with the crisis that we face. Uh, we need to work together to get past this. Uh, I also want to say, wish you were here. And I mean that very sincerely. We wish everything would get back to normal. So how do you get to this project? The front end, which is where the feature articles and the front pages are, on the Cross Public Library website. The tab is research, and then Heroes Next Door. Uh, you can also go directly to the archives part of the project, but that only includes the original newspaper articles that I scanned and that Scott has processed into there. It does not include the feature articles on the front pages. So we're going to go to this live. At the library homepage, acrosslibrary.org, under research, and then Heroes Next Door. National World War II Memorial in Washington, D.C., which is a fabulous memorial. I've been here also. The three portions of the website in the service, on the home front, in the big picture, and here's the uh, young man I mentioned that was interviewing veterans. Jeff, we're thing? not seeing the web page on our end. It's still showing the PowerPoint. Oh, okay. Um, okay. 
What if I you have to, this? Jeff, you have to go to uh, share screen again and pick the new tab. Pick the, the new tab. tab. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, new tab share. where the yeah the okay. library pages. Thank you, Scott. this okay are you seeing it now no no okay there's a pop up here in the way let me go here again there you go okay i'm getting fluttering so something's happening yep we're seeing the libraries page now okay good all right, so at the library page and research. Heroes next door. The National World War II Memorial I mentioned. And here's our in the service. And I update this every time I update the page weekly. The number of images that scan. We have we're approaching 400,000, or 4,000, excuse me, 4,000 scanned images. It's about in the service. We'll probably hit that before the end of the year. On the home front, about La Crosse County residents supporting the war effort, uh, we are getting close to 1,000 scanned images there. And then the big picture, which includes just the front pages of the La Crosse Tribune. I think I'll start with that. So clicking on the image. My original intention was to keep the whole year's worth of front pages on the web website from 1945. Well, the website was not having any of that. It was getting to the point where I could barely log in to update it. I knew I had to delete a bunch of stuff. What I settled on is keeping four weeks worth of front pages, the, the most recent four weeks. The most recent is on the top. And if you follow the directions right here, you can zoom in and read all the text on the front page. So we go through seven front pages, and then you get to the week before that, etc. And as I add new ones, I'm taking off the old too. I'm going to go back to the web page and we'll look at in the service. Little introduction here. I'll point out this link right away. Previous featured articles will get you to a page on the library website that has all of the previous featured articles that I've written for the whole year. And I'm keeping four on the front part of the web page. Uh, this is one that I just finished recently about this marriage. Nothing unusual about this marriage except the circumstances that led up. To it. I won't spoil it by telling you. The uh, secret of it, but do read it. It's quite an extraordinary story. A uh, little sidebar about this. When I started to see articles about this Gerald Quackenbush from West Salem, who was a POW in Germany, my mother's neighbor in West Salem is Jerry Quackenbush. So I asked him, I asked him is that any relation to you? And yes, that was my uncle. So he uh, he told my mother a little bit about the story. I kind of filed that away in the back of my mind. I said, this might make a future story when I get to the point where I can use it, where I have an article to hook to it. And that happened last week. I contacted Jerry Quackenbush, my mother's neighbor yesterday. Got some great material from them, the family history books and photographs, and uh, personal information that I usually don't have when I'm doing this. So that's the most recent article in the service, a story about him. And as you go down the page, his article, and then I uh, highlight a few other stories from the week, and then see more here. That takes you out to archives, where you see the actual articles, the original articles that were saved. And then further down, I do uh, have sources and notes at the bottom of every article, so I'm a very I have to be very careful about setting my sources for this work. 
And then you pass that, and here was last, uh, last week's feature article, and there are two more underneath that. When I add a new one, I'm taking off the oldest one and putting that into the previous articles page, which I'll go to now. Oh, excuse me, not going too fast there. Hope nobody gets seasick. The previous feature articles. So the numbers you note know, the week, first week of January. Uh, here's the home front article. Here's the in the service article. And then so on. The weeks. Menegers, yes, it is that Menegger family. Four of uh, John's family were in World War II. Uh, there are articles early on here that I would like to revise. Uh, the 106 division disaster, there were many more lacrosse county men involved in that than what I had in there that I knew at the time. Uh, what I found in doing this is that the news traveled slow. At that time, they talked about all five or six men from this 106 division that were captured in the Battle of the Bulge. Later on in the year, when men were liberated from the camps in May and June, more of them were showing up. So I should really go back and revise. Uh, another one is uh, Buddy Iwu about the Battle of Iwo Jima. Again, there were many more lacrosse county men involved in that than what I have in the article, because I just didn't know about them. It was months later, there'd be an article about somebody in the hospital wounded at Iwo Jima, somebody getting a medal for heroism on Iwo Jima. And even the, the most important part, or one of the bigger parts was, there was a man from La Crosse County who was in the unit that raised the first flag on Mount Suribachi, not the famous photo flag, Rosenthal, but the flag before that. A man from La Crosse was in that 30 or so man platoon that went to the top and raised that first flag. I don't have his story in there. I need to, I would like really like to go back and revise. But you can see all through here, week by week, and all of these are connected to what was happening pretty much that week. In the previous articles. And the previous articles linked from the home front and the in the service go to the same page. They're both there. If I go back to the original and we'll look at the home front. Who would have thought that buying a car would make the newspaper? But it did in 1945 because this was the first. New automobile purchased in La Crosse after the war. There was no production of automobiles during the war because the uh, automobile plants were manufacturing things in our manufacturing. And it was Dr. Gunderson, who was a veteran himself, who bought the first car in that story. And the same kind of format as in the service article story and sources, and then the one from the previous week. Again, four articles on this page, and I move them into the previous article. So when you go to the Seymour here, this takes you to the back end, the archive part of the project that Scott manages. And it links you right into that week's articles. So for example, if you click on this, this is just a thumbnail, you can read the whole article on the archive webpage, the original articles. And moving to the top of this, you can go back in any month and see those articles. You can jump right to those. So here we're back in March. For those articles. And at the bottom of the page, too, you can also work your way all the way through the services the same. There are separate categories on the home front in the service. You can see all the scanned articles, all of which were about 5,500 articles uh, in this database from our work. I guess uh, a few comments to end my portion of this. Uh, this project, I've learned a lot. It made me appreciate what went on then even more. 
It also points out the value of local newspapers. If there weren't local newspapers, we could not have done this. And even the county newspapers, the Alaska, the Bangor, the, the uh, Omen, uh, and West Salem News that came in, that was an important part of this. And putting together the stories, it, it gave those little puzzle pieces that we needed to better some of the stories out of these people. And when you lose your local newspaper, you lose this day by day history of what has been going on. Uh, I'm not sure what's going to happen in the future when. Uh, when local newspapers are no more, or when they're totally online, hopefully things will be saved. So for history's sake, we can use them. And I'll say that uh, I've, in my 36 years at the library, I've never spent more hours on any single thing. I'm looking forward to the end of the year. I enjoy doing this, but it is sort of a grueling uh, timetable, but uh, doing the scanning for the week and weeks in a week and writing articles every week. Uh, we have about six weeks to go, and at the end of the year, we'll keep this on the website for a while. Uh, I have an idea to reconfigure it a little bit to take, uh, make a little smaller footprint, but the archives side of it will always remain there and accessible. So that's all I have to say this morning. Thank you for your attention. Uh, are there any questions that I can answer? Michelle says, thank you. It's amazing work. And you've inspired me to pull out my World War I diaries. In the business, we call that the primary sources, those letters, those diaries. Those are extremely valuable. And I, I'm afraid that many of those have disappeared over the years um, when people die and the people who are left maybe don't care as much or, or aren't as cognizant of the value of those things. Uh, at the archives here, we're always uh, welcoming those sorts of things at the library. To preserve if you don't have space or interest in it, please bring it to the library or wherever you are to your local library or a museum or historical society so that, that those primary sources are preserved for the future. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Jeff, for all of your hard work and research. I know we all appreciate it and we've learned so much about the local contributions those in our community made to the war effort. So thank you so much for this year long project. I know it means a lot to you and to, to everyone out there. So thanks for sharing that with us. And thank you all for joining us today. Uh, again, sorry for the uh, difficulties with the audio. Hopefully we can sort those out in the recording and you can hear it better then. And hopefully you'll be available to join us next week when we'll be learning about downtown Main Street's initiatives for 2024 or excuse me 2040 and how we can help support local businesses during the pandemic so thanks again for tuning in and hopefully we'll see you next week bye-bye take care